yet. Just turn in your Bible to Psalm 128. And tonight we're talking about the blessed man who fears the Lord. Psalm 128, a little six verse psalm. Let's look at it together. The Bible says, Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants all around your table. Behold, shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Let's pray together. Lord, tonight we ask you to bless the reading and the teaching of this psalm and the understanding of it in our hearts, Lord. We pray that you'll open our hearts, Lord, to teach us what you would have us to learn tonight. And Father, speak to us. And Lord, change us tonight by your word. We lay ourselves at your feet. And we ask you, Lord, to do your work in our hearts. We pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So this psalm is a very short psalm, but it's a very powerful song, just six verses. And of course, it's another one of the psalms in that little group of psalms that we've been looking through. What do we call these? The Psalms of? Psalms of Ascent. <laughs> okay, so uh, I don't know whether Solomon wrote this one or not, but it is a Psalm of Ascent. These, that's, that's a group of psalms there from Psalm 120 all the way through 134, the 15 psalms. That's there from 120 to the 134. And this is one of those in that group. And th what Psalms of Ascent are, these are the psalms that the Israelites would sing when they were making their journey up to Jerusalem to go to the temple to worship the Lord. And some of the Israelites lived, you know, far out. And so when they're making that long trip, you know, this, these are the songs they sang. When we were kids, we used to sing, row, row, row your boat when we were on a long trip, right? Play the ABC game. They sang these songs, right? So they were more spiritual than us and our children are today. But it, even if uh, they were uh, people who were Israelites who lived in Jerusalem and they just had, you know, a short little walk, they would sometimes sing these songs. And they were happy songs because they were going to the house of the Lord to worship. But sometimes there was a worst case scenario. It was a bad situation because the reason they were away from Jerusalem is because they were under the hand of God's judgment, because they had been disobedient to the Lord, because they had, uh, they had sinned against the Lord, and so the Lord brought his judgment on them. And so their enemies had defeated them and carried them off as slaves into a foreign land. And so sometimes they were coming back to the land of Israel and you know that maybe their temple was destroyed you know in some of their during some of their captivities they have to come back and rebuild the city and rebuild the, the the temple have to rebuild their homes and replant their crops and all that kind of stuff and so it was much harder yet it was still a joyful song because their captivity was done the Lord's punishment was done he was bringing them back he was restoring them to their land bringing them home and so it was joyful it was there was a heaviness about it but yet there was a joy and there had a joy in the fact that, you know, we've learned a lesson. We've been chastened by the Lord, and now we know this doesn't ever have to happen again. We don't ever have to get out of the will of the Lord like that again. We can, we can continue to worship Him. We can continue to love Him. And so they would sing these songs as they were coming back to the city of Jerusalem. And so they, they would return singing this psalm. This is one of them. And there, there'd be a great deal of mixed emotions. They'd have been feeling some heaviness and some grief, but all that was probably far outweighed by the joy and the fact that the Lord had delivered them and also by a renewed commitment that they were making to live obedient to the Lord. And there would, would have been a lot of joy in their hearts because they knew none of, this, none of this had to ever happen again. None of this kind of judgment had ever happened to them again as long as they live in the fear of the Lord. And that's what this psalm is about, is the fear of the Lord. So we're going to begin tonight and we're going to see First of all, and we're going to see two major divisions in this psalm. The first one, and then, you know, there's two major divisions. And, and the first one has a few different things we're going to look at here. But the first one is the blessing, the promise of blessing on those who fear the Lord. The first part of this psalm is where God is promising a blessing on those who fear the Lord. And we see that in verse 1. He says, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. And you see two terms there. We see who fears the Lord. That's one term. And then the other one, who walks in his ways. It says, blessed is everyone who does those things, fears the Lord and walks in his ways. And really, you can take those two things and wrap them up into one because those two things go together. You fear the Lord, you're going to walk in his ways. And while we're talking about this, I want to make sure we understand what the Bible means 
when it tells us to fear the Lord. We need to understand what that means. We, you know, we hear people use that term. Really, when I was younger, um, uh, I, I used to hear that term uh, a lot more. I would hear older people ask the question, are you a God-fearing man? Anybody ever hear somebody ask that question? Are you a God-fearing man? Yeah, God bless three of you. All right. Uh, I would figure bro Brother Wesley heard it because he's a, almost as old as I am. Yeah, Brother Larry's heard it. So, <laughs> are you a God-fearing man? We don't... We, we, yeah, yeah, that's what, you're, that's what my parents taught me. So uh, they would ask that. But it doesn't seem like people really talk like that anymore. People don't really uh, talk like that very much anymore. And I think that's because people don't really like the sound of that. They don't like uh, talking about a God or thinking about a God that we're required to fear. But guys, we better get used to that because the Bible is full of that kind of talk. You read your Bible, you're going to learn and we're supposed to fear the Lord. And we just see one example of it right here tonight. In this psalm, the psalmist has told us, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. But we see it repeated many times throughout the Word of God. In uh, Psalm 33, which we studied months and months ago, the Bible says, let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the earth stand in awe of him. In Proverbs chapter 9, the Bible says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom, okay? And, and that means that uh, you, you want to be a wise person? Do you want wisdom? Which, which is the, the uh, Solomon tells us at the beginning of Proverbs. That's the most important. That's the principal thing, to get wisdom. But, you know, if, if you want wisdom, you can't even begin to get it unless you learn the fear of the Lord. You can't be a wise person unless you begin with fear of the world. The fear of the Lord is the, is the beginning of wisdom. Romans 3.18 speaks about the wicked. And you know what it says about the wicked? It says they don't fear God. It says there is no fear of God before their eyes. You know these people that we see on the news today that are tearing windows and doors off of buildings and going in and, and tearing up stuff and setting places on fire and stealing things, and they don't have any fear of the consequences. Do you know why they're doing that? Because they don't have any fear of God. They don't have any fear of consequences. They don't, have, they don't think they're ever going to be judged. Now, if my mama had been around, she'd got her wooden spoon out, and she'd have put the fear of God in them, right? She would have done that. But they don't have any fear of God. And so it's all through the Scripture, we, and we know it's important that we live in the fear of God, but what happens is people don't want to, to they don't like that. And so they don't want to talk about it. They don't really want to believe that there needs to be any fear in their relationship with God. So either they avoid talking about it, and you, and you just don't hear very many sermons about it, the fear of God, or, or they just try to water, you know, what, what sermons you do hear about it in church, they try to water that truth down. They try to explain it away and say that the fear of God means something else or something less than fear. They try to tell, tell people it doesn't really mean fear, it really means that we're just supposed to respect God or, or we're just supposed to show God a lot of honor or we're just supposed to really, you know, love God. But guys, we can't just take truths that the Word of God teaches us over and over again and try to change the meaning. And, and if we do a study of the word fear, uh, it, in the Old Testament it comes from the Hebrew word yare, which, which that means not respect, not honor. It means fear. It just means fear. And when we look at the New Testament, the Greek word is phobios. And the word that sounds like that is the word phobia. And that's, that's a word, and it means fear. It, it doesn't, and so when we're looking at the meaning of the word itself, we, we can't really ju be justified in saying that it just, it just means respect, or it just means anything different or less than fear. The word fear, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, as far as the word goes, just means fear. So when the Bible tells us to fear the Lord, the only other way that we can understand outside of the fact of what the word means itself is by looking at how it's used in context. And so I want to show you a couple of places in the Bible. I want to start with a place in the, in the Old Testament where the Bible uses the word fear. And I'm going to use a place uh, where not just a, a man uses the word fear, but I'm going to use a place where the Lord is commanding the children of Israel. This is the Lord speaking, and he gives a command to the children of Israel. And it's Deuteronomy chapter 13. Can you turn there if you hold your place there in Psalm 128 and just turn to Deuteronomy 13. We're going to look at verse 6, and the Lord is giving the law, and uh, it's being given to the children of Israel. Deuteronomy 13, 6. I hear your pages turning. You're getting there. 
And here's uh, what the Word of God says. If your brother, the son of your mother, right? And my brother, from, not from another mother, but the brother who's the son of my mother. Or your son. I mean, do you love, how many of you love your brother? All right. God bless you. The rest of you, you're supposed to. Or your son or your daughter. If you have sons or daughters, how many of you love your sons or daughters? Okay. Uh, or the wife of your bosom. <laughs> that sounds sexy. Uh, the wife of your bosom. Uh, if it, how many of you love your wife? Right? Or your friend. Okay, we're talking about all these people who we have a relationship with that we're supposed to love them, right? It says, if any of these people that you love as your own soul, who, any of these people who is as your own soul, if they secretly entice you, saying, let us go and serve other gods which you have not known, neither knew you nor your fathers, of the gods of the people which are all around you, near to you or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent to him or listen to him. So if, if somebody you deeply love, your brother, your sister, your, your, your son, your daughter, one of your best friends, your wife, if they say, let's go off and worship other gods aside from the Lord, you shall not consent to him. Don't listen to him. Nor, he says, shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him, nor conceal him. You're supposed to report him to the authorities. That was the law in Israel. You're supposed to report him to the, to the authorities. He says, you shall not spare him nor conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be first against him to put him to death, and afterward the hands of all the people, and you shall stone him with stones until he dies, because he sought to entice you away from the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And then he says, so, verse 11, so all Israel shall hear and fear, and not again do such wickedness as this among you. So here in the Old Testament, the Lord commanded the Israelites here, we begin to gather here from what he commanded here, that the fear of the Lord has to do with the fact that we know he can punish us if we're disobedient to him if we turn away from him, if we forsake him. So we obey the things he commands us because we don't want to fall under his chastening, under his punishment, under his judgment, under his wrath. Okay, so I want you to turn to the book of Luke. Look at the book of Luke in the New Testament because we, we looked at one in the Old Testament. Now, now let's look at one in the New Testament. And we have here in the New Testament, book of Luke chapter 12, beginning verse number Four. And this is Jesus. He's getting ready to send his apostles out to do ministry in the regions round about. There's a companion, a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 10, if you want to take time and read it sometimes. But this is Luke chapter 12. Jesus is speaking to his disciples out there when he's getting ready to send them out. And, of course, they've got a, a lot of hard work and a lot of challenges before them. There's going to be a lot of probably uncomfortable situations. They're going to be threatened. The people are not going to like their message. Jesus says to them, do not be afraid. That's good, right? Do not be afraid. It, but what does he tell them not to be afraid of? He says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. Right? And after that, have no more that they can do. Right? We don't have to be afraid of people that can kill us. We don't have to be afraid of that. Right? You can't scare me with heaven. Right? Uh, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. He says, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him. This, and, and who's this talking to us here? And this is Jesus, God. This is the God who created us. He says, but I will show you whom you should fear. This is Jesus saying this, and he's speaking about God the Father. And, of course, Jesus is one with God the Father. Jesus says, I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. All right? And so that's pretty clear. But if that's not clear enough, Jesus says, yes, I say to you, fear him. Okay? That's what Jesus says. Fear God. And that's very clear from the mouth of the Lord Jesus himself. And from, from God the Father, both in the Old Testament from God the Father and, and here in the New Testament from Jesus Christ himself, that it, it is the fear of the Lord's judgment that motivates us to obedience. It is the fear of the Lord's judgment that warns us against disobedience. I want to read one more passage to you, if you would. Genesis chapter 22. And uh, as you're going there, you're probably familiar with that passage. It's when the Lord 
commanded Abraham that big test that he put him through. I want you to offer your son Isaac, your only son Isaac, up for a sacrifice. Of course, Abraham, a picture of God the Father, and Isaac, a picture of Jesus Christ the Son, and God the Father giving his son. It's a great picture in the Old Testament of what God did in sending his son into the world to die for us. Father willing to offer his son. It's Genesis chapter 22. Let's look at verse 9. It says, They came to the place of which God had told him on Mount Moriah. Abraham built an altar there, and he placed the wood in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham, listen, he stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad we don't have to do something like that? We don't have to offer our children up in sacrifice because God already offered his son up in sacrifice for us. There's no need for us to offer any more sacrifice. God says, do not lay your hand on him or do anything to the lad, but listen to what he says. He says, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And, you know, that's, that's fear in the Lord. I'm sure that Abraham was afraid of the thought, but even the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 tells us Abraham knew and he believed God that the Lord would raise his son up again. Hebrews tells us that. But I'm sure Abraham was afraid of the sadness and the loss he was going to experience if he, if he, if he, if he slayed his son on that altar. But he was more afraid of being disobedient to God. And so, he's, so, so the angel said to him, he says, Now I know that you fear God, since you've not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And so we see this over and over throughout the Bible, that f the fear of the Lord always goes hand in hand with obedience. Now I do realize, the Bible tells us, if you look at 1 John, and we hear this when we talk about the fear of the Lord, some of those sermons that kind of try to downplay the thought of the fear of the Lord, the, people always quote 1 John chapter 4, in verse 18, you know what it says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, it says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. And people say, well, what about that? That's absolutely right. But do you know what the Apostle John is talking about? He's talking about the kind of confidence we're going to have in the day of judgment. And that day has not happened yet. Okay? He's talking about when we stand before God, when we stand and we see Christ, as, as, he, as he tells us, he's, gonna, he's already told us in, in 1 John in, in chapter 3, uh, Beloved, we're the children of God, but it's not yet been revealed what we shall be. But when he is revealed, we, sh we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And we're going to be changed. Us, this, this corruptible will have put on incorruption. And we're going to be made perfect. All our sin is going to be gone. We're going to be made holy. We're going to be made perfectly into the image of Christ, and there's going to be no more sin problem. We're going to be made perfect in love on that day. And so in that day, there's going to be no more fear. Perfect love is going to cast out all the fear. But for that hasn't happened yet. Okay? That hasn't happened yet. Right now, and you know what, guys? I, I loved my, my father, but I was afraid of him at the same time. He still kind of strikes a little bit of fear into me every time I see him. Because he could take off that belt in one little motion. You know? And I can remember up in my room, you know, Mama, if, if Mama, Mama was not a pushover, but she knew when I was pushing it to the limit. And, and there were times when she would say, okay, wait till your dad gets home. You know? And then I knew. And I just better pray, Lord, please come quickly, because I knew my dad was coming home. And, uh, and, and it wasn't going to be pretty. But you know what? I love my dad. But I also lived with that fear, I knew. And, and also, I know, and I, I didn't really appreciate it as much at the time, but I appreciate the fact today that he raised me up with discipline because it kept me from going in a way that would have really hurt me in my life. It really kept me, and, and that's what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, that when you're chastened of the Lord, don't despise that, because the Lord loves who he chastens. If you love your children, you're going to discipline them. You're going to lead them in the right way. And so John's telling us here about something that's going to be com completely fulfilled when we come face to Christ, when we've been changed. Uh, but that hasn't happened. Right now, uh, we, you, you, you all know as well as I do, that hasn't happened. 
Our love has not yet been made perfect. We look forward to that fact that it's going to be made perfect. But until then, we fear, we tremble in reverent awe before the presence of a holy God whom we deserve nothing better from than his wrath and his condemnation. The only reason we haven't received that is because of Christ, because of God's mercy. May we get that. May we learn that. May we say with the publican who's crying out in the temple, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. May we say with the psalmist tonight, uh, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. Now, in my study of this psalm, I have read some commentaries. I always read quite a bit. I listen to a lot of good, really good sermons. Uh, and there's some really good guys I listen to. Um, I've heard a few good teachers say that the blessings spoken of here really only technically applied to the Jewish people under the Mosaic Covenant as long as they obeyed the law. And that seems, you know, uh, to make some sense when we're looking at this from a legal perspective. That makes sense when we're looking at this technically. But you, you see, when we're, when we're talking about promises God made to Abraham and his sons forever, I don't think we have to understand these things technically or legally, but I think we really ought to understand these things by faith in the God who promised. I don't think the blessings in this psalm are limited to being Jew a Jewish thing, especially when I see these words in Psalm 128 and verse 1. Because I've heard a lot of people say this, and I don't know why they're stuck on this, but here's what it says in, in, in verse 1. He says, blessed is not just the Jews, not just those who do the works of the law, but it says, blessed is everyone, everyone, okay, who fears the Lord and who walks in his ways. So my, may we tonight look at this not, uh, not just as something that's, you know, just, just promised to a group of people who lived a long time ago, but this is the word of God, and it means just as much to us today as the day it was written. The promises of God are for us. These are for us. Let me ask you, what better way can we walk in the ways of the Lord than by walking in Christ? Walking in Christ. As a matter of fact, there's plenty of proof all throughout the Bible that shows us that we can't walk in the ways of the Lord through the law. We can't do it. So I want you to look at these blessings tonight as being available to everyone who fears the Lord and walks in His ways through Christ. The psalmist talks about some very rich blessings here, so I want to take you kind of through those blessings real quickly. Don't worry, we'll get done pretty quick. I, I did a long introduction. Uh, uh, introduction. So, uh, happiness in the fruit of your labor. That's the first blessing. Uh, happiness in the fruit of your labor. And so verse 2 says, when you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy and it shall be well with you. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good blessing. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy. It shall be well with you. Nothing like working real hard on something and then just having it all fail. It hurts, doesn't it? But first of all, I want you to notice that the Lord is telling us there's going to be work to do. There's going to be work to do. We live in a world that's cursed by sin, right? Right? We, we've read the story, Genesis chapter 3, uh, the Lord cursed the ground and said, man, you're going to work the ground. So we, this means that we must go out and live by the sweat of our brow. Six days shall the man work and then rest on the seventh day. That, that's just the, the curse that's on us. God's not promising here that he's going to bring us breakfast in bed, that we lay, sit there and wait for it, right? God feeds the sparrows, right? His eye is on the sparrow. Have you heard that song? His eyes on the sparrow. He, he feeds the sparrows, but he doesn't bring the words, the, the worms, and put them in their mouths for them. They have to go out and get them. And he doesn't promise here to bring us breakfast in bed while we lie there and do nothing. But he is promising that if you live your life in the fear of the Lord, and if you're willing to go out and work hard for it, then he'll bless and protect the fruit of your labor to such a degree that you will find a happy enjoyment. He's not promising here that he's going to make you rich. He's not promising he's going to make you wealthy beyond your wild, wildest dream, but you will 
find a happy enjoyment, a happy satisfaction in the work of your hands. If, you, if you're willing to work for it, God will bless that and you'll be happy and satisfied. If you live in the fear of the Lord, he will bless the labor of your hands so that you'll not live in lack. You'll be able to say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And your, you and your family will be well provided for. If you live your life in the fear of the Lord, God will protect the labor of your hands from being taken away by your enemies. From being ruined by pestilence, from being ruined by mildew, from being ruined by disease. When you live your life in the fear of the Lord, what you work hard for, you will be satisfied in. You will be provided well by. You will be happy and it will be well with you. That's a wonderful promise. Live your life in the fear of the Lord. The second blessing that uh, way that uh, the psalmist tells us we're going to be blessed is health in the family that you love. In verse number three, he says, your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. I want to tell you something. Every day I get up and I thank God for my wife over here because she's the very heart of our family. I think about Proverbs 31. She looks well to the ways of her household. She has done me good and not evil all the days of her life. Her children will rise up and call her blessed. I do not deserve that girl. She is so good to me, and she's so pretty. And I'm, I saw myself in the mirror this morning. I'm so ugly, so cotton-picking ugly. Uh, why do I have so much hair on my face and none on my head? That is a, a great blessing to have a godly wife who loves her family. The family who has that is truly blessed. And this is the promise from the Word of God that the Word of God makes to the man who lives in the fear of the Lord. His wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the heart of his house. And he goes on to say in the second part of verse 3, your children like olive plants all around your table. And, and I want to tell you, this is one of the things I really treasure. Children are a treasure. We just saw that in, back in Psalm 127 when we met a few weeks ago before Thanksgiving. I'm so thankful that my wife and I and our kids, they all grew up to know the Lord and, and, and we're close and we get together often, usually after church on Sundays and then sometimes other times. And we go to Taco Bell together a lot and we go to Taco Bueno together. Pretty much any place that starts with taco is good. Um, and I, I love it when we can get together and I can look around the table and see all of them and their wives and even my son-in-law, it's, it's okay even though he's really ugly, I can still get to see him because my daughter loves him and so I love him too, even though I give him a real hard time all the time. But I do love him. I'm always thankful when I can look up and see all of them around the table. I'm glad and it's a real blessing. It's a joy that they put the roots down close. Listen to what the psalmist says. He says here in verse 4, he says, Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. He said, it's going to be blessed, and he comes back and he says, the man who fears the Lord is going to be blessed like this. He repeats it. Isn't that great? And I can testify, this is true. Now, maybe there's a person who says, no, you know, well, it's too late for me. I, I already blew it. I already lost my family. And I, and I would ask you, are you still alive? Some of you, you know, you had a broken marriage. Some of you had, you had a, a divorce in your life. Some of you, but my question is, are you still alive? Are your kids still alive? And if the answer to both of those questions is yes, then, you, then have you considered getting on your knees and humbling yourself before God and committed to living out the rest of your life before the Lord in the fear of the Lord? It's not too late to start right now. And it may not ever be exactly the way you dreamed what it was supposed to be, but if there's a breath in your lungs and just a trace of hope and faith in your heart and the will to love your family, your kids, and maybe you, you know, you, you're, you're, you had a family and it's broken, and, but, but God's given you a new start, and, and that happens sometimes, and God takes that and he blesses it. And, and you know, you think about King David, you remember he, he murdered Uriah. He got so far out of God's will, he looked down off that rooftop and he lusted after Bathsheba and, and, he, and he committed adultery with her. And then he, he, he tried to cover it up and he ended up murdering a man trying to cover that up. He, he went so far. We think this is scandalous, but God forgave him. God pardoned him. God says, I put away your sin. But he, he, he had some... And he had some judgment in his life. He had some suffering in his life because he paid some dear wages 
for that sin, yet God forgave him. And you know, Bathsheba and him, they went on to have another child. That woman that he who was in that sin with, they went on, they, they got married, they had another child. And you know, that out of that, out of that relationship came the family line through which Christ came. God's blessings came on that family line that was so broken with such devastating sin. And I believe in a God who has mercy like that. You say, well, it's, it's too late for me. No, it's not. If there's breath in your lungs, if you have any family that you can love, love them and fear God. Because the man who fears God and walks in his ways is going to be blessed. God gives new beginnings. Secondly, the, the second point that we see in this psalm, the proclamation of blessings on those who fear the Lord. First, we've seen the promise of blessings, right? God says this, that person's going to be blessed. But now the psalmist proclaims blessings. And so in, in verse 5, he says, the Lord bless you. He doesn't just say the Lord is going to bless you here. Now he makes it personal. He says, the Lord bless you out of Zion. We've talked about Zion, haven't we? That's the place where the Lord manifested his presence. Mount Zion is there in Jerusalem. This is where it gets personal. Before this, the psalmist has been speaking about how the man who fears the Lord is going to be blessed, but now it becomes personal because now the psalmist, as a prophetic writer of God's word, is speaking a blessing over you. He's no longer just talking about a man that the Lord's going to bless. He's pronouncing the Lord's blessing upon you out of Zion. He's doing it right here in God's word, which as we have discussed, this is the place where the Lord chose to dwell in the midst of his people. And just listen to the blessing he speaks concerning the man who fears the Lord. Verse, verse 5, he, he continues, he says, And may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Now, Jerusalem to the psalmist and to the, to the people the psalmist is, is speaking to here, Jerusalem is their country. And so what is our country? America. Man, we weep for our country sometimes, don't we? Wouldn't it be something to see the blessings of the Lord coming down upon our nation again and from now and all the days of our life? Wouldn't it be nice to never in our lifetime have to see our nation overcome by famine or war or pestilence or loss. Wouldn't it be nice to know that through every problem we may face, the Lord is going to protect us and, and bring us through it and, and take wonderful care of us. That's the blessing the psalmist is pronouncing upon the man who fears the Lord. And I believe he's pronouncing it under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because this is scripture we're looking at. And he continues to declare that blessing. In verse 6, he says, Yes, may you see your children's children. Oh, you're going to get me fired up here. You guys who already know this blessing, okay? Uh, I, I don't have Brother Larry knows what I'm talking about tonight. I don't have to explain it to you. Something I've learned over the years, and, I, and I've seen it at work in the lives of many. If you raise your children right, you will be able to spoil your grandchildren someday. But if you spoil your children, you're going to end up raising your grandchildren someday. That's kind of the way it works. I've seen it. But I never understood it when people talked about, about this thing with grandchildren. But I am loving this grandparent thing. I'm loving every single minute of it. You, you get to have twice as much fun, and then you send them home, right? This is really cool. I, I, I love it when I, when I go and I I do that, and she looks at me, and she's, and it's like I'm a ride at Six Flags that she loves to get on and go with for a while. It's just, she thinks I'm the coolest thing in the world, and she likes me just like Cruz likes me. She wants to be in my arms, and I, and, and it's just awesome. I love being a granddad, and I love my grandbaby, and I know that I'm looking forward to more and more, but what a blessing to be able to raise your kids up to know the Lord and love the Lord and then watch your kids raise their kids to know the Lord and love the Lord. Brother Larry was talking about dropping his kids off here for vacation Bible school. He was so, they were so excited. They, they were at the movie watching the kids' movie, you know, which kids are supposed to be all right. And they were like, when do we get to go to the BBS? You know, it was the VBS, but the BBS. A blessing that God sees fit to bestow upon those who fear him. The psalmist says, you'll see your children's children. 
And the psalmist closes this psalm with this statement. He says, peace be upon Israel. Again, he's talking about their nation. And they had peace as long as they lived in the fear of the Lord. That's what happened in the nation. You read through the Chronicles and you read through the Judges. As long as they feared the Lord, Israel had peace. And you know, we've seen America have peace and prosperity. But we've seen also when we've turned from the Lord, we've had judgment. And I believe it's the same for us. When they forgot him, they had trouble. Today, as New Testament Christians being justified by faith in Jesus Christ, we have, as Romans chapter 5 tells us, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God means that we used to be the enemies of God because of our sin, but Christ has now paid the penalty for our sin, and so through him we now have peace with God. Peace has been made through Christ. We're not the enemies of God anymore. That's what peace with God is. And we have that, but we don't just have that. We also have the peace of God. We have the peace of God. And that's the amazing thing about living in the fear of the Lord, is that when you have a proper fear of God, there's no reason to be afraid of anything else. The world can be falling apart all around you, but you'll be okay. Like Jesus and the, the ship and the, the disciples are going ape bonkers, you know, and they don't know what's, they're, they're like, Dude, what, why can't, and what's Jesus doing? He's taking a nap. He's got his head on a pillow. Guys, I've been up all night healing people. I'm tired. I'm taking a little nap over here. And he's sleeping peacefully, just getting a little bit of rest. They're like, Jesus, how can you sleep? We're about to die here. He wakes up. And he calms the sea. Powerful. Master over the wind and the waves. And you know what they did? They worshipped him. They worshipped him. When you learn that, you know, as you go through the storm, he's in charge of the storm. Did you know that... Uh, you hear that story about when Jesus walked out. It's very similar. When Jesus walked out to him on the water, did you know that before he walked out to him on the water, he sent him across, and then he climbed up into a mountain to pray? You know who he was praying for? He's praying for those guys. He went up in that mountain, and he's praying, and I'm pretty sure up in that mountain he had a pretty good view of them going out there in the sea in, the boat, in that boat. Do you know he's sending them right out into the storm, and he's praying for them? that they can have faith. And they go out there and the, they're afraid and then he walks out to them. He walks out to them on the water. And they're afraid. They, they think he's a, just a spirit. But he says to them, don't be afraid. You look at the, the Greek language, you know, he said, in, the English, in our English Bibles, I think they miss it a little bit, that he said, be not afraid, is it is I. But really what he said there, he said, it's the ego of me. He says, be not afraid, I am. And of course, Peter, you know, he got out there and he walked on the water for a minute, you know. He reminds me a lot of Nate. He, uh, <laughs> he walked on the water for a minute. But Nate's a little more bold than I am sometimes. At least he got out there and walked. I stayed in the boat, you know. <laughs> I was like, go, Nate. Yeah. <laughs> you all wet. But uh, Peter gets pulled back up in. And, and of course, Jesus brought him to the shore safe. But they worshipped him. They worshipped him. And that's the thing. When, when, you, when you live in the fear of the, of the Lord, you don't have to be afraid of anything because you know that he's in charge of the wind and the waves and the storm and the war and the economic collapse and the inflation and the gas prices and everything, he's in charge. So you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to worry. Nothing else to be worried.